This is the 20th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guide Batteries, Pro, Gamakatsu, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning, and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk bass fishing. It is the pre-classic edition of BTL, returning to Grand Lake for the third time. Is it going to be one shallow? Is it going to be one deep? Is it going to be one up the river in muddy water? Is it going to be one down lake in clear water? Is it going to be one power fishing with bait casters and spinner baits and jigs? Is it going to be one offshore on a spinning rod with a minnow or a Demiki rig or a Nico rig? There's so many questions that we have to answer. And that's the beautiful thing in this sport is uh, I feel like in a lot of the other sports, particularly stick and ball sports, particularly uh, sports that do not have a lot of uncontrollable variables in them. We kind of know how things are going to go. And there's going to be like one or two critical moments in, in a golf match or a tennis match. Uh, and golf has a lot of un unpredictable variables, but in the stick and ball sports, we kind of know, we basically kind of know what the score is going to be, how the game's going to go, unless you get an outlier. This is a wild card this week. And I think that's one of the reasons why we all love fishing. You don't know what you're going to get when you've been on the water. They got three days of practice. Then they were off for three days. Currently Wednesday, March 20th, the competitors are on the water for the official single day of classic practice they run through they do the national anthem they have observers they take off on grand lake they fish all day today just like they would like it was a Bassmaster classic tournament day they have to be back by a specific time in their flights they make their final preparations then tonight is the night of champions kyle welcher gives his angler of the year speech uh, all the classic competitors get dressed up i'm sure depending on how they're uh, practice is gone depends on uh, how active the open bar is and then tomorrow media day that's when the nerves probably really kick in they do a dry run through in the arena and then all 52 competitors fired out of wolf creek on friday morning so if you've been listening to btl you know that in 2024 uh, johnny schultz from the deep dive app and fish the moment has been uh in on the show previous to each elite series tournament to kind of break down how analytically how uh, objectively things are supposed to go down based on past history using the deep dive app and a uh, wealth of information a lot of stuff on grand for this time of the year for past tournaments across a number of different circuits so i said why are we going to just limit it to elite series tournaments uh tomorrow we'll have kind of a look uh frank we did a recorded show frank's going to talk about what it's like to be in the classic how fast the week goes by how important the decisions are we had kyle patrick in studio last week that was talking about preparing for his first week and then uh we had a, a classic uh, preview show yesterday with Pete Robbins, uh, outdoor writer who's been to 20 plus of these things. So I feel like we've got the classic covered uh, really well. One of the things that we are going to do is each night following the classic, somewhere between 9 and 11 at night, I will be back in the BTL studio. I have a panel of experts and anglers who are not fishing in the classic who are going to jump on and we're going to have a uh, breakdown show following each day of the classic so if you're at the classic you can watch it late at night if you're not at the classic you can stay up and get some late night btl but that will be the classic coverage also before we get to johnny real quick the bassmaster classic expo taking off all sorts of uh incredible uh opportunities to uh get your hands on look talk to the people if you're thinking of a major purchase also to meet a bunch of people uh at the end of the show we're gonna have matt looney who is uh you, you guys know him as the pro guide battery guy he taught me just enough about batteries to be dangerous, but uh, he has transitioned. He is now in a role with Bass Cat Boats. He will be in for the last 10 minutes, talk about all the different types of cats that will be at the Bassmaster Classic Expo uh, in Tulsa. If you want to get up in there, crawl around one of the new uh, uh, Puma, a Jag, any of those, uh, he's going to be on to talk about that. Uh, 
Friday, I'll be uh, with Omnia from 12 to 1. Saturday in the Pradco booth with Frank Scalish, 12 30, 2 o'clock at the Bass Tank on Saturday. And then Sunday, 11 o'clock at the Bass Tank, 12 o'clock at Pradco. And then I will also post times for uh, Sunline and get your hands on some of those new Nano Alpha Gamagatsus uh, that they'll be giving away. Stay tuned to Gamagatsu USA for that. All right. I think that kind of takes care of it. Let's bring in. Johnny Schultz and dude, you are everywhere. I'm watching Brandon Polinick's video talking about deep dive. I'm watching uh Red Crest, the MLF stuff, talking about deep dive. And then you're on this show. So good job of diversifying as if you weren't uh, already embedded in the industry now. I appreciate that. It's been a lot of fun. Been uh, kind of hectic the last few weeks. There's a lot of tournaments happening, getting prepped. We're actually going to have a booth at the Classic as well for Deep Dive and for Core Tackle. So Okay, yeah, so you that. could stop by and say hi to Johnny Schultz himself. So that would explain why the slides that we're going over today, I did not get them until 7.45, which usually it's two days in advance, and you send me a follow-up text and email to make sure I got them and if I had any questions. Usually you're 48 hours ahead of where okay. I am in my chaotic organization. Uh, but I would imagine that you've got to have a pretty full plate. Are you guys actually going to be selling core tackle stuff there? Or is it just kind of a booth? You're actually going to have stuff for sale? Yeah, we actually have stuff for sale. We have uh, three new products we're launching at the Classics. You guys can come check those out that have never been seen before. So that's going to be really cool. And then we also have some classic special stuff from core tackle with some red hooks that we're doing. So like hover rigs, Ozark rigs, Tush all in red color. So pretty cool stuff there. So definitely drop by the booth. And then actually the core tackle booth and the deep dive booth are right next to each other. So I can kind of hop between the two. So you can also check out all the stuff with the deep dive booth. We'll be doing classic updates throughout the event with all the most recent conditions, water clarity, section of lake stuff, wind effects, all that stuff. So we're going to be doing all kinds of cool stuff. And that actually is right by the bass tank booth as well. So you can swing by, see Matt at the bass tank and then swing by and, uh, hang out with us over at core tackle and deep dive. I think it's going to be a mob scene. Not, oh, not yeah. just those booze, but just the, just the expo and the classic in general, especially if like Christie or Palmer goes off on day. one. If one of those two is going to go off on day one, probably both of them, uh, especially the way this is setting up. That's what we're going to get into uh, today. We've talked a lot about the mental side of this. We've talked a lot with Pete Robbins about the preparation and how the different anglers go about it and the media. And we've talked with a bunch of the anglers in the classic about the setup to it and how it's like an eight or nine day process before this thing even starts. But the playing field, the playing field is what we're going to focus on today. And I think for the, the BTLs kind of classic week coverage is going to tie it all nicely. So thanks for jumping on. For sure. Yeah. And I got uh, some slides I sent over to you, Matt. They're going to be more like water clarity and just kind of general lake overview. But I also have some data here. I didn't have a chance to make, make them all into slides like I normally do just because I got two booths. Come on, man. Come on. Stuff, what are you? You, so. you got busy or something? You're trying to run two booths <laughs> and three companies and four YouTube channels? Yeah, it's, it's kind of hectic over here. But I do have all of the raw data, some back end stuff. So I wanted to get some context with that data from the Deep Dive app. We have a database of over 10,000 tournament patterns. And we actually have 156 tournament patterns specifically from Grand Lake in March. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Grand Lake <laughs> tournaments in March. That's 156 patterns from top 10 finishes and professional level events seen with like video proof. So this is not just like going onto the best baits page and be like, guy caught him on the spinner bait. No, like we watch these guys catch these fish. So got a lot of patterns here. I, I think this data is interesting, but I also don't know how relevant it's going to be because a lot of this data is pre jig head minnow shaking the minnow patterns. Um, there's some red crest stuff in there from a couple of years ago, obviously that, uh, could be relevant, but dude, I think it's my personal opinion. This is subjective. The more I've dived into this and talked to people, I think this data is going to be shockingly relevant. Okay. I think okay. we might, I think we might have a hybrid old school derb on our hands here, Johnny. It could be, it, uh, could be it also, we could. We could be surprised. I've been surprised. I didn't expect that the Lay Lake tournament would go down. I know it was every fish counts, but those guys are out in the middle of the river over 80 feet of water chasing spotted bass around. Um, you know, Beeswax Creek was not a player on Lay Lake this year. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I could see some interesting stuff going down. But anyways, let's go through some of the data. So basically, if we look at Grand Lake tournaments in March, 100% of the bass are getting caught in pre-spawn patterns. 
not really any winter fish, and we're not late enough to get into the spawn yet. So we're dealing with straight up just pre-spawn bass fishing. Now, some of those tournaments in the past have been really tough this time of year, but some of them have been really good. So it kind of is a, a it's going to be interesting to see which one it plays out because I remember there was an FLW tournament back in the day when it was just like a grind to catch five fish. If you had a limit, you were doing well. There was a yeah. Toyota series a couple of years ago in like March where like Drew Gill was fishing in it and he got a top 10. And he had like seven fish over two days and he was like near the top 10. So like, and that was with a rigs. So like it can get rough out on grain, yeah. but it also can be really good where we see Edwin Evers catching, you know, almost a 30 pound bag final day of the tournament, bunch of 20 pound bags. Recent tournaments have been taking 22 to 24 pounds to win. And there's a lot of 18, 19, 20 pound bags. So Grand Lake's fishing well right now. I would say we shouldn't expect to see a struggle fest at least. So from a, I'm going to throw some just stats at you, Matt, and then we can kind okay. of run through these. But based on the data, it shows that in the past, based on top 10 finishes in March, 80% of top 10 finishes come in stained water, 16% in dirty water, 5% in clear water. So wow, stained water 80% of the time is where you're getting the majority of your top 10. Now, fish. what are you calling stained? Like just as a general rule, of yeah, I would say it's like maybe two to three and a half, four foot of water. So anything four feet plus is like okay. real clear. Anything less than two feet is dirty. That's kind of the range that. We yeah. Use. So clear water is a unicorn on grand this time of the year, as far uh, in, past, in past, as far yeah. as top 10 finishes. Correct. Wow. That surprises me. That is interesting um next we have whether the angler caught their fish shallow or offshore to get a top 10 finish so based on the data 84 percent of top 10 finishes come shallow so that's casting distance from the bank basically 16 percent offshore so stained shallow water is kind of in the deal for all these tournaments in march so to your point earlier matt it could go down because that's where it seems like a lot of the better quality fish are at least this time of year. And that's what anglers have used to be successful. But what we've seen with the recent tournament results that we do not have enough data yet to input is that the 5% clear and the 16% offshore has been dominant mm -hmm. yep. in recent fisheries that are not typically one offshore and clear water during this time of the year. Correct. And Toledo Bend, Lake Fork, Yep. Uh, you even take red crest there at lay like all of that stuff so it's literally a flip on the head from what our eyes have seen over the past year to what the data has shown over the past 20 years and that's the that's the interesting part because in the past anglers were targeting individual fish that are getting up there they're roaming down these banks with spinner baits jigs crankbaits we'll get in the baits here in a second but um the thing that i find interesting is if someone can find a spot where those fish are suspended out deep. I'll give you an example. We'll get into this with some of the slides I sent over later, Matt. But what I found two weeks ago, I was out on Grand. I don't live that far away. My boat, I was actually going to do a bunch of videos out there, and then my trailer axle broke. And so, oh no, to go. like on the highway, like where you yeah, stuck like on the highway. My tire didn't come off, thankfully, but like I noticed it. But yeah, so I was like, I had to get tow truck and everything. So, oh no, tire. that sounds like a, oh, I've been there. That sounds yeah. like a disaster. I mean, that's what you get for running a 2005 Triton. But anyway, so yeah, more power to you. Uh, basically, I was here trying to get out there and fish more, but I was down on the lower end of the lake two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago ish. And I was finding bait fish in the mouths of pockets and creeks on the lower end of the lake. Over 80 feet of water. Some of the bait was as deep as 50 and a lot of the bait was in 20. Now, this is just anecdotal stuff. But what I will say is that I was catching a lot of catfish and a lot of drum around those areas. Didn't catch any bass. Didn't really see a ton of bass, but I didn't really try that pattern for too long. But I also ran in the same situation on Beaver Lake about maybe three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. I graphed a creek. Mouth of the creek was loaded with bait. Bait was over 80 feet of water. It wasn't really a player. I couldn't find any fish around it. I got word this last weekend, though, that the guy who finished second place and a bunch of guys who finished in the top like 15 of a Beaver Lake tournament were in that exact creek that I graphed earlier, and the fish were loaded up in there. So two weeks ago, bait fish, everything in the mouth of the creek, no bass. 
the bait migrated a little bit further back in that creek and the bass were all over them. And that's where one of the most dominant creeks on the lake. So just with that anecdotal thought, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, if the bait was already that deep a couple weeks ago, it's not like it's going to go straight to the bank and be super yeah. shallow. So I don't know. I, I think there could be a really good Demiki rig deal going on there. If someone finds the right Creek that has the bait and has some bass around it. And there's probably not going to be too many areas like that. So it may be, three or four potentially around the lake but if someone finds it i mean it could be i hate game over it. didn't michael neal find one in in on grand in uh in red crest didn't he find one of those areas and almost won yeah so connell he had it like basically those bait fish were on the main lake they started moving in and he just was going around and just and even the guys who were catching them at lay lake with the jig head minnow there was a 500 yard stretch that those guys were in and there was like nine boats in there, 10 boats in there. And they were just circling around each other. No, and I'm talking about Neil on Grand. Oh, Neil on Grand. Years yeah, ago Neil on, Grand. on Red Sorry, yeah. But, but yes. it was one 80% stained, 84% shallow by Bobby Lane, pitching a jig around shallow structure and docks. And well, if, yeah, if you, if you zero the weights, maybe it'll then five fish though. Cause Bobby was catching some good ones too. Um, throughout the tournament so it's just mm -hmm. it's it's real and then wheeler was freaking smashing them too catching yeah. big ones and jordan lee fishing offshore brush piles with yeah baits. So, sorry i got you off track no we're good we're good there's there's so much going on that's the thing that's that's why like predicting this tournament is going to be so confusing but let's get back to the date a little bit so again march top 10 finishes from basically a bunch of bunch of uh, patterns if we look at the section of the lakes now we're looking a little bit more narrowed in but just section of lake and the way we do section of lakes we basically break it up by mid lake lower end upper end so break your lake into a third and then we break those thirds into more thirds so you do first half of the creek back half of the creek main lake so that's how we break up our sections of the lake when we're capturing the data based on the data the mid lake section accounted for 63 percent of top 10 finishes so mid lake is dominant followed by the lower end with 19% and the upper end was 17%. So kind of an even split between the lower and the upper end, but mid lake dominant. I mean, we know mid lake offshore structure in the mid lake area is a, a classic grand pattern. Uh, <laughs> Casey you know. Christie won so many BFLs there. I just throw it a spinner bait in the mid lake area. <laughs> really? <laughs> but the mid lake area is definitely uh, a deal. And then from the within that mid lake area, this is the interesting part 40% of the top 10 finishes came in the back half of the creek in the mid lake area so 40 percent of top 10 finishes came back half of creek mid lake area that is dominant like a lot of top finishes come in that zone and then the next highest is the main lake in the mid lake area followed by the upper end back half of creek so there is some main lake stuff i know that there was like a tournament uh it was a classic i think like 2013 i believe where cliff pace he was catching them on a jig more main yeah, lake main lake docks and drowning and stuff things like that so that's kind of where there is some stuff going on there and i know there's some main lake fish to be caught it's just going to be interesting because it's like we're seeing from the data shallow water stained water back half a creek mid lake section which is kind of the more stained up area anyways what that's telling me from my brain, at least what my brain is telling me is that there's the biggest population of quality fish for top 10 finishes in the mid lake section, in the backs of the creeks, in that stained water. Now that is using traditional techniques as we've talked about. So it's hard to believe because I know how many big fish are in Grand Lake all over. It's hard to believe that someone can't figure out a way to catch really quality fish 15 quality fish in other sections of the lake now that they can target individual fish with forward facing sonar mm -hmm. but we have just haven't seen that now i know there's some guys in some of the local derbies that are really 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 good with their forward facing sonar and they're jumping into these tournaments and they're getting top fives on grand after getting top well, first place or like second, third place on like Table Rock, they're Demiki rig guys and they're jumping these tournaments. They haven't really fished a ton of these tournaments before. They jump into Grant and they're catching 20 pounds, finishing top five. So it, I don't know if they're Demiki rigging or forward facing sonar stuff, but like that's their deal and they're doing well on Grand also. So I don't know. There's some, 
there's some stuff cooking up here, I guess. You know, I, it sounds like you have like a little mild PTSD from the past year as an analytics guy. It, it, it's really everything rough. turned it's, on its head. Oh, uh, everything I can think of is not is not. I guess everything I've always done. We talk, people talk yeah. about this all the time, yeah. but like when I go to the lake, Matt, I don't feel like all of this data is as relevant to me in the as it was in the past, and all this I think it's still very relevant stuff. though. And I feel like you've talked about this with me too. And I think it's been said on this podcast, even it's like, if you could forget all this stuff and just say, I'm going to go grid out a lake, grid out hundred yard sections of the lake with my forward facing sonar, find areas where they have the most concentration of fish and bait that will bite my bait. Mm-hmm. And I can go around and do that the entire time. And I don't think about, Oh, that dock looks great. I'm going to go skip a yeah. jig. Oh, there's a nice rock transition. I'm going to go throw a crank bait or throw a spinner bait in the back of this sunny pocket. Like if you don't have that in your head, all you know is I'm going to take this minnow and this a rig and this jerk bait, and I'm going to go around. And I'm just going to find the biggest fish I can with my scope. The Drew Gill pattern, like where he talked Gill about pattern. breaking right down now. the lake, not taking anything away from yeah. that. I mean, he's very analytical with it, but that's what he does. And it's like, in you know, from a decision making standpoint, you can get spun out very easily if you have a lot of yes, things going on. <laughs> yes, I head. can, Johnny boy. That's the truest statement said on this show. So if you don't know what you don't know. And the pattern that's the most dominant pattern right now for facing sonar works everywhere right now. I don't know if that's going to consi- can, you know, persist for two, three, four years, but at least right now it's true. It gives those guys an advantage because they only have one thing they're doing. Mm-hmm. And that makes it, they just go around the entire lake and look for that one thing. Three full days of practice, three or four days of the tournament, even if they can't find it in practice, it's not like they are going to say, okay, I'm going to do a fallback thing now like Christy will do. Like if Christy doesn't find fish offshore live scoping for two days, do you really think he's going to give it another day and then give it the first day of the classic to go, you know, hang a minnow around? No, he's probably going to go check all of his old spinner bait holes and crank bait holes and all that stuff. Well, now he's splitting up his three days of practice where the guys who are just jig head minnowing, that's all they're going to do. That's all they do. So it gives them an advantage when that's the most dominant technique right now. It's like when the A-Rig was the biggest deal. If you weren't just going and picking up an A-Rig and throwing the A-Rig, you weren't going to do well in most tournaments. And the guys who just committed to it just threw it and figured out where they're biting the A-Rig dominated. And that's just, it, I'm not saying it's a, it takes less skill or anything like that. I'm just saying that it's just, that is transition. The, that's the transition that we're in right now. And I'm sure that those fish are going to start getting condition to it those fish will get more pressure things are happening but i mean matt there was a a team i i don't i, don't, I believe this is true i'm don't quote me on this but at least i've heard that there was like a 17 and 18 year old team that had a 30 pound bag of fish on table rock this past weekend and they dominated and i haven't heard of a 30 pound bag on table rock in years and it's a 17 and 8 year old kid who were live scoping them and it's like that's insane and they also won the tournament the day before so they won two tournaments back to back and they're just dominant with that tool. And it makes them, because they're so good with that one tool, and that one pattern, that they can dominate these tournaments on lakes that are super big tournament lakes. So anyways, big tangent, but uh, that's kind of the caveat of everything we're talking about here, because this data is really relevant. If LiveScope was out of, the, fa- out of the, the equation, this data probably is exactly what's going to happen in the tournament. Because there's enough, there's enough sample points, the statistically significant yeah. data, everything. But that's the caveat. So we're going to get into how to actually find those live scope areas mm-hmm. in the deep dive app, because even though we have this data, we also have tools like wire clarity and wind and things like that, where we can actually get in and look at the best Demiki rig jig head minnow areas on the map. And so we'll get into that. You just, saw, you just highlight the middle, Johnny. Duh. <laughs> I got it. I got the app. I, I will, I'm going to come out with an app to rival yours. And all it's going to do is going to find like the anatomical middle of every lake. And, and you could drive to it and you could know that geographically you are in the middle of the lake. Not, not the little bit to the left, not a little bit to the right, but the middle. <laughs> That's awesome. That's all it's going to be. That's it's going to be called be. find the middle. Well, let's go finish this up real quick, Matt, on the data side, because we're kind of... Yep. Uh, no, tanky. yeah, we got to get into baits because we're putting together a badass picture right now, and I'm yeah. excited to, to to finish that picture before we get into some images. Okay, so recap. Pre-spawn, stained water, shallow fishing, mid-lake, back half of creeks. Sounds pretty familiar. Sounds like a Christie deal. Um, 
in terms of where these guys are fishing, channel swing banks, secondary points, flat banks. That's your deal you're dealing with. So flat banks, so P flat pea gravel banks, channel swing banks, maybe where they transition between the pea gravel and the channel swing, and secondary points. Ton of that stuff in the back half of creeks in the mid lake area with the stained water. Guys have talked for years on Grand. There's a certain water clarity that they like based on certain situations and things Grand like Lake that. Green. In that stained range that is best, the best water clarity in a given day based on the weather and the wind and the sun. And like, that's where all of the past experience comes in. It's like, do I need to be in three foot of visibility on a cloudy day, but two and a half or two foot of visibility on a sunny day and things like that. And should they be on the flatter banks or the steeper banks today? And that's where like, if guys, if that pattern's going, guys who know how to do that and know how to make those adjustments like a Christie, they're going to be hard to beat. So then we get from the structure to the cover. So cover wise, we're dealing with rock transitions, laydowns, and chunk rock. Docks are also in there as well as brush piles. So there's a lot of stuff there, but rock transitions, laydowns, and chunk rock are kind of the key. You see a lot of docks on Grand Lake. But a lot of the times, anglers aren't actually catching fish off the docks themselves. They're it's catching them off the, the dock. transitions behind, a lay down that's laying behind the dock, chunk rock in there. So docks can be a player, like actually fishing off the dock with a jerk bait. Iconelli did that day one of one of the classics in 2013. But I think that it could be kind of that like rock transition deal if it's a shallow deal. Okay. And then finally, baits, spinner baits is 24% of top 10 finishes in March on grand came on a spinner bait, a medium diving crankbait. That means a wiggle warp basically, or a rock crawler. That's 19% is a medium diving crankbait. Flat sided crankbait is 12%. So if you're 31% on a, on a wind and plug. Yeah. 31% of the wind and plug and then 24%. So we're basically 50% of the top 10 finishes come on a spinner bait or a crankbait. And then a jig would have to be third. A jig is flipping jig and finesse jig combined for about 14% if yep. you combine those two jig types together. And then a jerk bait, if you combine different types of jerk baits, that's 17%. So 17% on the jerk bait, 14% on the jig, 31% on a crank bait, 24% on a spinner bait. So you're just looking at old school, just yeah. Baits. Those are the baits everyone knows. Mm -hmm. Now, 4%. On the jig head minnow. Ah, oh, that's that recent. One, well, yep. That's uh that's a sneaky one because it could be rising up in popularity potentially. We don't know. Uh, but uh Johnny, I remember I was fishing a tournament on Graham probably th three years ago, early in the year. And I just I was just messing around with this thing. And I got over a brush pile and I was like, let's see what this oversized crappie jig looks like. And it was a tough day. This is one of those deals that everyone has, like where you're like, oh, I didn't realize what I had at the time. And I had cast it maybe three or four times. And I was like twitching it, reeling it in out in the middle. Could kind of see some stuff, but wasn't like dialed in on the individual fish yet. This was probably four years ago. And I got over a pile, clear water down lake at about 25 foot of water. And I dropped it down. And I watched this freaking fish come out of the pile, lit it up, three pounder. And I was like, dude, that was so cool. Watch the fish come up and it ate it just like a crappie would. And then I went on about my merry way, chucking an A-rig down the bank. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's another story from the same time. This is actually a, this is a, I think it was the last week of September, first week of October. So this is a little bit different time of the year, but I caught them on grand 2021 and I was throwing an A rig and a big paddle tail swim bait on the lower end of the lake, getting over creek channels. Now, this is when I first got live scope. I had live scope for like three months at this point. Now, I was catching fish out of 40 to 45 feet of water, over 60 to 80 feet of water. And I had 17 pounds throwing an A rig over the middle of the channel, basically. And that was in September, October. So there's big fish down the lower end that do that. Now, I've tried it again in now and there's a lot of drum catfish other stuff and, so and the guys that i know who have done that who spend a lot of time down there they do it for those nickels tournaments and it's almost like pulling a slot machine because if you hit it and they're there and you run into them it's low to mid 20s now here's the other side of that 75 percent of the time 
you can't contact them down there. They're pelagic yeah. fish that are really relating to the bait. I've had deep, I've had long discussions with guys like, dude, like they're like, when you find them in that, uh, particularly that, uh, uh, catch them yeah. down to the dam. It's big, clean blimps yeah. that aren't used to seeing lures and are pelagic fish, but you could go back six hours later and it's, moonscape for the next three days so they're willing to risk that every single time going down there because if you hit it you win game over if you don't hit it you don't even go to weigh in well now think about the guys who have the the double live scope off the side they can swim out 100 feet maybe they figured out that they can just go find those fish day of the tournament with Mm -hmm. all their seven live scope transducers oh that's true also you can do that yeah i I forgot about that but uh, would you not think based on and we'll get back to the data in a second we'll just just chat for a minute here would you not think based on the recent you take a look at the future bass and you look at the nickels and the lack of 20 pound bags out there and then kind of who was in the top and then you look at the color of those fish that they're holding up in the pictures that that bite right now as we speak on grand is not incredibly strong those don't look like deep offshore fish to me a lot of them it looks like there's a mix and i would also think if that bite was strong there would be way more 20 to 22 pound bags than just a handful of 20 pound bags and a lot of 17 to 18s i i think that what's going to happen is there's going to be some areas of the lake where it's going down and it, I think it's not like a beaver or a table rock or some lakes like that. When you get those more stained water lakes, I think the areas that hold a lot of bait and a lot of fish you can catch with that four facing sonar are limited. I think there are limited areas where it really, really goes down. So yeah, that's fair. That's very fair. I don't fair. think that there's, I think it's maybe less of a factor of it's not, it's not that it's not going down. It's just, there's not as much of that type of water on these types of lakes. But what that also means is like, there's, there's guys like, I remember there was a, uh, in the mouth of one of the marinas out there for red crest day one, Edwin Ever smashed him on a jerk bait and he was catching him in the middle of a little like shallow cut. It's basically like a little boat channel and he was catching him on a jerk bait. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a Demiki deal specifically, but it could be guys targeting isolated fish, in drains shallow shallow drains with a jerk bait like 10 foot drains things like that and it's still going to be a forward facing sonar deal it may feel different but it's the exact same thing it's fish that maybe you're setting up right on the bottom or just swimming around randomly and if you get into a little drain that's loaded up with five pounders they're getting ready to pre-spawn i mean there's a lot of that stuff out there too so uh, it could it could look very similar to what fork was like where it's like there were some fish really deep but there are also some guys who are catching them up Mm -hmm. in five to ten for the water and drains but they're all live scoping like even mckinney caught a six and a half though off a dock and kyle patrick caught fish skipping a dock and guys were up shallow so i think that there's there's some ways you can see both but i think that it's i don't know at least my gut is telling me that someone's going to figure it out i don't know if it's going to work for the entire tournament i don't know how it's going to go down because i'm so i i I fish grand a lot too so it's hard for me to Mm -hmm. fathom like three days of that and knowing the lake, but I think I'm a little bit biased just with the data and with everything. Yeah, so am I. Hard uh, to... All right, let's run this down real quick before yep. we get to, then we're about ready to get to the slides on that. So the data right yep. now shows the most predominant thing, 100% pre-spawn in 80%. Or, so these are the highest percentages, pre-spawn, stained water, shallow in the mid lake region, in the back halves of cre- creeks and coves, focusing on flat pea gravel banks, channel swings, and secondary points with the structure of rock, chunk rock, laydowns, and docks, mainly in that order, more importance focused on the rock that is behind the docks or the rock that the laydowns are on, throwing some form of shallow running crankbait, followed by a spinnerbait and a jerkbait. That's how the numbers say it should go down now if you go to the exact opposite which we're saying there no one's sure but this is very realistic you're literally going to take the opposite of that you're going to take the clear water which is five percent offshore which is only 16 percent in the lower lake which is only 19 percent on a jig head minnow which is only four percent yep that's why this is an awesome classic i could honestly see either one of them winning a hundred percent. Well, that's where we get into these slides, Matt, and the data here, because this is kind of what I did with these, with the deep dive app 
and the water clarity and things like that is I wanted to give an idea of what the water clarity has been like to give a perspective. And then also, basically, I want to try to pick out some good live scope areas because we talked about where to, like, we can go show all the areas, the backs of pockets and stuff. I think guys kind of get that if you are, you know, it, that's 20 plus years of history on that sort of stuff. But like this is the new hotness, I guess, is the live scope stuff. So if we take a look at the water clarity, though, in the Deep Dive app, we have a 30-day historical water clarity viewer. So you can look back 30 days in the past on the water clarity. So two weeks before the Classic, you can see the water was pretty clear on the lower end. Honey Creek, which is right there in the Mid Lake area, pretty clear also. Even up the river, it's not super dirty. There's not a lot of dirty water two weeks ago. We did get some rain, though, in the past few weeks. So a week before the Classic, you can see that the lake has stained up a lot and dirtied up on the upper end but it stayed very clear on the lower end and that mid lake is getting a little more tint to it just a little bit more stained up which is maybe good for that shallow bite but if you look at official practice you can see that the mid lake section there's still stained water but there's not as much stained water as you would actually think it's actually pretty clear across the lake especially on that lower end which may benefit those guys who want to do the forward facing sonar stuff we also had a big cold front it's very cold here right now uh, at least in this area and so it's been like 30 degrees it's warmed up a little bit in the afternoons but it's not been super warm the last few days so that could have an impact um so it it's not like the lake is muddy or just like chalked out with mud which would make that shallow bite way better there's favorable conditions on the majority of the lake for that you know offshore deal if, if someone can find it Okay, we move to the next slide then, Matt. Uh, let's see here. Got some areas I think that could be a big player. So this is Honey Creek. And if we look at the water clarity maps, you go back up one more time, Matt. You can see that it's kind of hard to see, but in the two weeks before the Classic, you can see that the water in the back of Honey Creek is pretty clear, That's relatively this clear. Right here. And now if you look at the official practice, you can see it's stained up in the back of that creek. On the, yeah, right there. That's freshwater inflow coming in. And it's right at this choke point. And we know that Honey Creek Bridge historically has been really good. There's not a lot of creek channels or any like crazy stuff going on there. But whenever you get that influx of water coming in, it brings in new nutrients, which could make those bait fish flood that area. And if there's a lot of bait congregated there, those bass around that bridge, maybe 100, 200 yards on either side, think Gunnersville sort of situation where guys are out on either sides of the bridge throwing, you know, glide baits, Alabama rigs, swim baits, the Mickey rigs. This could be a really big player right here with that fresh nutrients coming in. There's it's stained water, but it's not, it's clear to stained water, plenty of visibility for that. Guys were catching them really well on fork fishing stuff, similar to this too. And there was grass there is a little bit different deal, but anyways, if there's bait in this area, this could be a hundred percent a player. It's big and flat and open, and guys could just get out there and just pan around and scope. And we know, you know, Matt, how many big bags have been caught right in that circle right there. Next slide. Doesn't no comment from Matt. <laughs> okay. Next up, uh, next up, we got uh, lower end. So on the lower end, we have clear water throughout the entirety of the lake. This is that Ketchum area you talked about, Matt. That little circle there is a creek where I found bait fish two weeks ago in 50 feet of water over 80 feet of water. So they were in the mouth of the creeks two weeks ago. If those bait fish are pushing back in these creeks, there's a couple of these creeks down here where Michael Neal was catching them really well on the Demiki rig in Redcrest. There was a, a thrift was back in one of these creeks catching them on jerk bait. He, I don't know if he was live scoping as much, but uh, he was catching a bunch of fish, did really well. And then this is also the area I talked about earlier where there, you can just get down down there and I mm -hmm. catch him over 40, 50 foot of water. So. This is the dam right here for those who, whoa, sorry. This is the dam right here. This is uh, catch him right here. This is rapier hollow. I don't know what they call this. Uh, I don't know either. Anyway, so that- Is that dripping of, springs? It might be dripping springs, yeah. So this is the kind of the wild card for those live scope guys. If they can find some groups of fish in this area- there may be enough fish that are sitting off the bank chasing bait. There's a lot of bait on this lower end right now. It could be a deal. It's just, it's going to be a little bit tricky. There's a lot of no wakes in this area too, from the mouths of the creeks all the way to the backs. So you can't just like run into all these creeks and just fly through them. You have to kind of idle through them. So it could be a little bit inefficient, but I don't know. It could be really good too. 
Interesting, because that's pushing mid late. Because you've got duck right here and, and drowning right there, but still, I mean, if you do chop it, that is lower half. Yep. And then the last slide is the winning area from the 2016 Classic, where Evers caught him way back in the Elk River. One thing interesting this year is the elk is not as clear as it has been potentially in past tournaments. It had been clear earlier this spring, like a month and a half ago. It could be clearing up, though, which could be a wild card. And also, we know that there's giant fish that live back up in this river. And I think that there could be a guy who, with the stained water, could... I mean, there's just a bunch of random channels and things back in here. And I could see someone just getting in the mouth of like start at the bridge and just randomly scope all the way to the back. And so you get into the, like the, the area where Evers was catching them. There's enough big fish back in there that there's a chance you could just scope around, catch him on the Demiki rig. I'm just th talking about these are historic areas. The areas I'm pointing out are areas historically that have big fish being caught. And I think that this could be a player with the forward facing sonar too, potentially just for the idea that, if you only need to catch five fish, these five, these three areas have big fish in them. Like the, the potential for someone, if they get on it right, and I'm, this might sound, might sound crazy, Matt, but there's a potential someone could have 75 to 80 pounds over three days if they get on a the right little deal with the live scope. That's 25 plus pounds a day. I don't think that that's re reasonable. That seems unrealistic, but I'm not going to call anything out because I also wouldn't have told you that I didn't think someone was going to catch 24 pounds and 30 pounds back to back on Table Rock. I would have said that's impossible, but it happened literally three days ago. So, like, I, I my brain doesn't compute what's going on with like fishing right now. But like, if I had told you, Matt, how much money would you bet that a 17 year old pair of high school kids would catch 24 and 30 pounds back to back in big regional tournaments and win? you would say that's probably not likely. And you would be like, where are they fishing? I'm like, Table Rock. You're like, no way. So I'm just saying it could go down. I'm, I'm probably going to be more close to like that 65 pound, 60 pound range. It's probably what it could be. But I wouldn't be shocked if it goes crazy too and someone finds them, you know, doing something like that. I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I guess that's the thing is I'm so confused right now with everything because we have so little data we just don't know the potential of all this stuff. And the guys who are out there are the best in the world at doing this exact thing, which is using the forward facing sonar. So we could be in for a really big surprise, or it could just be Christy catching them the exact way the data works. Either way is great for me because if the data is working, that's awesome because I love the data. But also, you can see we can identify some of these key areas with the deep dive app as well with the water clarity. So um, it just, it's a lot to think about. If I was in this tournament, though, Matt, I'll tell you what I'd be doing. I would be pushing the data to the far back part of my brain, and I would be gritting out the lake, and I would be live scoping. And I would do it for three days of practice, and I would do it for as many days of the tournament that I was in. And I would only do that. That's the only thing I would do. I would not have a spinner bait or a crankbait tied on the deck of the boat. I would have a jerk bait. I'd have minnow baits. I'd have things like that. And that's all I would be doing the entire tournament. That's That would be me. I will tell you one thing after this show, Johnny, we're either uh, going to wake up one morning to find severed pig's heads on our doorsteps or uh, a lot of expensive gifts. <laughs> There's some people that are going, no, no, no. That was that was a incredible, incredible breakdown of grand uh, for the past 20 years and then through the transition. Are you are you uh, are you willing to give a weight and an angler and a bait pick on BTL or do you just want to let it play out? Yeah, I can do that. Um, All right. Just trying to think. I don't know angler wise because I think the angler, so many good anglers out there. I'm not going to do angler because okay. I just Dude, think give me tough. a bait, weight, and area. I think someone's going to catch him mid lake in the stained water. So in the areas we're talking about, so mid lake stained water, maybe back half a Creek even, but I think you're gonna catch them offshore on a jerk bait and maybe a minnow bait. But I think that there's enough based on what I'm seeing in the data that stained water offshore mid lake back half a Creek is kind of what I'm thinking. But instead of using the shallow water patterns, you're basically in the area. If, if you think about it, you have 84% or sorry, you have 80% of fish are catch being caught in stained water. Mid Lake back half creek is 40%. So that's where the biggest populations of big fish are. 
So if someone can figure out how to catch those fish offshore rather than shallow in those zones, jerk bait's going to be a really good bait just in that stained water in general. And also it grand is not that deep in those areas. So you're not going to be dealing with fish over 50 foot of water. I think they could be in that eight to 20 foot range, eight to 15 foot range chasing bait. That would be my, my pick. I don't know if that's going to work out, but that would be my pick. Amazing. Uh, do you know what booth you guys are with core tackle and the deep dive app at the Bassmaster classic for those who will be there in Tulsa can just go straight to the goods. Yeah. So we're booth 2034 and 2036. Uh, we're right around the corner from the bass tank booth. We're kind of actually kind of, sm uh, smushed in the corner, uh, but you'll see us back there. Um, so, uh, check out the floor plan if you guys want to as well, but yeah. Who else going to be there, Matt? You're going to, you got Matt Stefan working his tail off for three straight days, daylight to dark. Yeah, he's actually going to be the one who's doing all of our purchase orders, all of our stocking, everything. So if you guys buy a lot of product, it will uh, all go through Matt. So you'll get a chance to talk to him and, uh, you know, make sure that he's working, uh, earning his keep over there. But no, we're, we're going to be doing a bunch of stuff there. And then we'll have the Deep Dive app. We'll actually have phones and tablets and things you guys can play around with Deep Dive app if you've never used it before. Uh, so you can check that all out. And again, we have exclusive products they're launching at the Classic. They have never been seen before that are launching there. We're also going to be doing a pre, or I guess it's like a classic special on Tackle Warehouse where you can check out some of the new products from Core Tackle as well, starting tomorrow on TackleWarehouse.com. So if you guys want to check out some of the new items from Core Tackle, check them out there. Fantastic. Always, uh, always appreciate our time uh, together. Bring your Sharpie, buy some <laughs> Core Tackle products, have Johnny sign your stuff. Uh, very cool. I, I just like the, I love the, the, uh, analytical look that it just gives me as I watch tournaments as a fan of the sport on the elite series to see, uh, to see how it shakes out. So for sure. Well, and I, this is the least confident I've been on any of my predictions so far, Matt, in the past, I've been very confident. My predictions, and they've come true, uh, fairly often, especially like even the Lake fork tournament last time we picked the, the zone, right. Where all the guys are catching them. Yeah. This is the least confident I have been in a, in a prediction just because the data is so you know i don't know it's just it's so different from what could happen it, like you said it's just polar opposites so it's it's gonna be interesting to see for sure uh, all right i'll let you i'll let you go a lot of work to do uh with just two days away from the opening the Bassmaster classic expo in tulsa go stop by Say hi to Johnny, big supporter of BTL, big supporter of the industry, uh, and adding a lot of information to help people catch more fish. So thanks, Johnny. Yep, thanks for having me on, Matt. See you guys. All right, see ya. All right, that is Johnny Schultz. I think that covers uh, how and when and why and where, regardless of how it goes down, I give you a good idea of what to look for at Grand. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, Matt Looney, yes, the Matt Looney, the battery guy who taught me everything I know, about pro guide batteries, but in a different role, a different position with bass cap boats. Now, uh, it was busy at red crest last week. I know I talked to a couple of you that got to crawl around some cats, uh, over there on lay Lake. I think that was in Birmingham. I think that's in Birmingham and, uh, going to have a good big floor plan at the Bassmaster classic. So just like we had uh Pate jump on with, with pro guide yesterday, we're going to have Matt jump on with bass cat. If you guys are in the market, want to crawl around these boats, ask questions, put your eyes on them touch feel the bass cats we'll be back with more of that information right after this the new puma sts has been redesigned from the ground up with the angler design function and performance in mind nothing on this new offering was compromised and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. Gamakatsu, the innovation leader in fish hooks, is launching Nano Alpha technology in 2024. Nano Alpha is a new finish available on Gamakatsu's most popular hook styles. It delivers two times slicker performance, 
four times better corrosion resistance. Nano Alpha technology makes the world's greatest fish hooks even better in 2024 to help anglers catch more fish. Born in Japan, using technology, innovation, and precision, Sunline produces the widest selection of fishing lines at the most technologically advanced line factory in the world. Manufactured at the strictest tolerances to produce victories at the highest levels of tournament bass fishing, from household names like Christie, Swindle, and Cruz, to young guns like Cook, Logan, New, and Welcher, they all trust Sunline to take them to the top of the leaderboard. Choose the line that will give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Sunline. Your early morning mentality is your every hour mentality. All gas, no brakes. Focus. Purpose. Power. Destined for the water, but confident everywhere else. A calming buzz before the storm, the truth of nature itself. You can't catch lightning in a bottle. There's a limit out there. But it's not with your gear. Unrelenting power delivery. Unparalleled weight savings. Keeping you on the water whether you run a 9-9 or out scoping your best find. In this rare air, there's power in the silence. It's a mindset. Thinking only of the things that matter and freeing your mind from the things that you trust. All right, welcome back, BTL, on a Wednesday, getting ready for the Bassmaster Classic on Grand Lake, the Cherokees, and a man who's been traveling a lot. Let's bring him in now. Matt Looney. Matt, thanks for jumping on. Uh, BTL, a little bit of different capacity uh, this time. What What is your job title at Bass Cat now? Like, what do you, what do you do in there? I know that you... Uh, You've been busy and had to move, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, man. So uh, I, I am fortunate to to be the um, sales and marketing manager at Basscat now. Um, got to join the executive team back in January. Uh, and it, it's kind of a crazy story how we got there. And, you know, hopefully one day we'll have a show. We can kind of go through that. It's, uh, it's kind of cool. Um, you know, very blessed to be here. Um, did have to move. So, you know, it's really funny for this classic specifically. I lived in Adair, you know, about 10 minutes from the dam on Grand and where all this event is. And then all of a sudden now I moved to Arkansas and we're right back here in my, my where I was from. So um, it's cool to be here in Tulsa. I'm excited for this event. It's always a good classic. Um, I've been part of several of them now, which is awesome too, uh, through different through different roles. But this will be my first classic uh, here with Bass Cat, and uh, pretty excited to get it rolling. Are you in the Classic Expo right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's people. If you look, they're setting up. There's some boats here. There's a you go horizontal with your phone so we can get a better oh. look at that. Oh, let's see here. Oh, okay. There we go. Did that work? Yeah, okay. perfect. Perfect. So there's a 500 R uh, on a Bass Cat right there. The boat runs, you know, 107 or so. So if you want to come look at that, that's pretty cool. Uh, we've got. The Cougar right here, which is a, a fan favorite for forever. The Puma STS is in mm -hmm. the show. And then we also have the new Caracal STS right here in the show. So uh, pretty excited to have that. And if you guys, uh, if you're at the expo, you can come. You can crawl around in them. You can look at them. You can talk to the CAP Pro staff members, to yourself, uh, to all the guys that are there for Bass Cat and yeah. really feel what it's like to be in a, in a cat. Oh yeah. Come and feel the difference Feel You know, again, uh, I'm fairly new to the role, but I've known the quality of bass cat for a long time. Thanks to, you know, working with them through pro guide. Uh, I've known Rick for a while. So come out, feel the difference of the boats. I mean, anything from the, even the gel coat to the carpet, there's, there is something that separates us from the rest. Um, Rick will be out here every day of the classic. I can has a big giveaway for kids. that's happening in our booth, I believe on Saturday. So, a lot of stuff happening at the Bass Cat booth for the Classic. And then also, if you already have a Bass Cat, the Bass Cat Owners Tournament takes place the end of April, I believe the 25th through the 28th. Can can cat owners still register for that? Yeah, absolutely. So registration actually opens tomorrow for that. Okay. Um, so it's, it's online registration this year through Fishing Chaos. We partnered with those guys uh, to kind of help run the logistics side of it. Very simple. You you create an account on Fishing Chaos, which all it is is your name and your email address where you have a login. Um, and then you can sign up for the event. It automatically 
It's going to give you your boat number, all that good stuff. We're going to go in order. So first come, first serve as far as what boat number you get. Um, so it's going to be a really cool event there. And then what's beneficial for the, the cat owners is your family is going to be able to kind of follow along through that fishing chaos. It's going to be a live leaderboard online each day. Uh, we've got a, a cool social happening after the first night where we're actually giving away a Puma STS to a random oh, winner. Wow. Uh, yeah. So all you got to do is be there for the event and, one random stick is going to get drawn for a brand new Puma with a 250 Mercury. So uh, a really, really cool event that I'm excited to be a part of this year. Uh, the MPFL is running the way in. So you're going to go across the huge MPFL stage. Uh, just a lot of really cool things happening. And then where's your next MPFL event? Oh, uh, we go to Hartwell at the uh, third week of May. Oh, that'll be an exciting one. It should be good. I hope, uh, it's uh, it also kind of aligns with high school graduation for some. So I know there's some crazy private jet flying back and forth to go to graduations, but uh, I think overall it should be a really good event. How many guys in the MPFL have private jets? Well, you know our buddy Kevin, uh, he's kind of he's kind of bougie and he doesn't own his own private jet, but he's got a private jet coming uh, so that he can go watch his son graduate after the first day of competition and come back before day two starts. Nice. That's fantastic. So, yeah. so you would recommend running three twelves in parallel instead. No, I'm just kidding. No bad. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny. Hey, I'll say this. What's funny is the VCL crowd is awesome. Um, we were just in Birmingham last week at red crest. It was by far the best red crest I've been a part of um, awesome. as far as, as far as attendance goes. Um, but I still had, we were right across from the pro guide booth. So they were right next to us. And I, I had at least five people come up and tell me how much they love the battery episode. <laughs> and I'm just, I just kind of laugh it off. And then they would kind of be like, well, what are you doing in this booth? You know? And, uh, yeah. So it, it's really, really cool stuff. Um, the BCL crowd's awesome, man. And I, I appreciate the amount of time you've let me come on here and talk. Well, I greatly appreciate it, Matt. I'll let you get back to business. Are you the one who's deciding like where the boats go? Like, are they saying, Hey Matt, where, where do you want this one? Or yeah. there, is, is that? <laughs> go ahead. No, I just wondered if that's your job. Yeah. I always no. wonder how the hell they decide what angles they go in the booths. <laughs> so we, so there, Rick has a thing that he likes on, you know, well, no matter which side you come from the booth, you should be able to see a different angle of a different boat. Okay. Uh, so if you if you walk in, you shouldn't see all motors or all fronts or all this. And so we actually sat down a couple of weeks back and, and mapped out Red Crest and the Classic because, I mean, they have to run electric to these. Uh, and so our trailer lights and things like that are on. So we have to be able to tell the – the venue exactly where the plug goes like within a one foot radius and uh these guys got it down pat i i cannot take credit for that it was already a really good system um but yeah it's it's great i'm excited excited to get this classic kicked off it's gonna it seems like it's gonna be big there's a lot of excitement already just in vendors um and we still got two more days of setup so rick is everywhere and all at once like i see him ripping around florida during the open i see him at yeah. santee cooper he's at all of it he's enjoying it he's back to fishing uh the opens i don't think people realize how many Bassmaster opens and invitationals and professional events rick pierce has under his belt but when i've talked to him at the tournament it's cool to talk to him about like on the water stuff like what's going on because he's always got a story you know like back in 89 oh, yeah. in 89 yeah. <laughs> in this past like it went down in here back in right. you know or 93 or i got in a boat race in this canal and i smoked him by like eight miles an hour it's it's uh, yeah it's cool to see rick so yeah stop by say hi to matt uh crawl around a couple of the bass cats there get your picture taken with Rick Pierce, I'm sure he will be uh, telling stories. I always try to talk to him during classic expos and stuff. The man right. speaks for 12 hours straight. Like he yes. never takes a break. All all yes. gas, no break. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it's awesome. And his memory is unlike anything I've seen. I yep. mean, for, there were people walk up at Birmingham and he remembered like what color stripe they had on their boat from the 90s. Like, I mean, it's crazy stuff so yeah come talk to rick he's very approachable if you come in the booth and he's talking just wait a minute and he'll come over he'll see you waiting and uh it'll be a good time all right i'll let you get back to it mr looney thank all you right. thank you so much all right see you all right that is uh matt looney with bass cap post take our final break of the show when we come back wrap things up kind of recap again uh what we have planned for the next three or four uh days classic week in oklahoma home state of Bass Talk Live will be back right after this. In 2023, we became a household name in the crappie fishing world thanks to Power Breaks the Game Changer. Hey, bass fishing world, buckle up, because <laughs> you're next. It's going to be fun. 
Welcome to the next evolution of our product line, Power Brake Sidekick, designed to install right on your shallow water anchors. We are the first and only fishing brake company to offer a breakaway system. Just like with the Game Changer, the Power Brake Sidekick has it as well. And it's not a matter of if you're going to need it, it's when. Power Brakes, the most durable fishing brakes available on the market today. Made right here in the USA with our rock solid two year warranty. Hey, not all fishing brakes are built equally, and you owe it to yourself to find out why ours are different. Power Brakes Sidekick, order yours today at mypowerbrakes.com. Have you considered purchasing new electronics for your rig? The type of mounts you choose to protect your investment should be part of the decision making process. No matter if you prefer one, two, or three graphs up front, Beatdown Outdoors has a solution for you. Adjustable, versatile, rigid, and made in the USA. What's your ultimate electronic setup? Check out the full selection of Beatdown Outdoors products by visiting beatdownoutdoors.com. Everything you need, one legendary brand. Time on Strike King. Any fish, any water. All right, wrapping things up here. BTL on a Wednesday. Uh, let me pull this up, Andrew Upshaw. If you listen to uh, Andrew Upshaw's pro pick, pros pick them, I think I also mentioned this on yesterday's show. He's doing a Let's Fish TV tour in 2024, and he will be set up at the Academy at 7850 South 107th East Avenue. Uh, could also be said 1850 South 107 East Avenue in Tulsa Thursday. That's tomorrow from noon to three central time. If you guys are getting in town, you're there for the area is going to have all sorts of deals. All sorts of guys are going to be uh, out there set up outside the Academy. Uh, if you have someone that's just getting into fishing, he's like spooling rods, reels, talking, fishing, uh, bait deals, all sorts of stuff. I'll be out there at noon tomorrow from noon to one at, 7850 South 107th Street. That's the Academy Sports and Outdoors in Tulsa. Like I said, Andrew was on the show last month, busting his hump uh, to do different stuff uh, to bring value uh, to the brand. And this is a really cool thing that he's doing with the Academy Tour. Then I'm going to ease over to the Bass Pro Shops in Broken Arrow for Bassmaster Media Day. Uh, and then that's all we got on Thursday, Friday, uh, most likely Saturday and then definitely Sunday night after there will be a post game show, a BTL post game show late at night between nine and 11. I'll put it up as soon as I know what time. Uh, if you guys want to make sure that you do not miss those shows, there's a notification bell on YouTube. Click that little bell. As long as you subscribe to BTL on YouTube, what that'll do is it'll let you know when BTL is live. We got Dan O'Sullivan, uh, from Advanced Angler, uh, Pete Robbins, a number of different uh, experts and pundits, some anglers that aren't in the Classic are going to come down, come on later at that night after each Classic day, break down what's going on so you can watch all the coverage, watch everything that's going on, watch the way in the post, and then uh, and then we'll have a post-game show uh, live from the BTL studios. So uh, I think that's all we got for today. Big shout out to Johnny Schultz. Like I said, check out the Deep Dive app. Uh, check out the Deep Dive app booth if you're going to be in Tulsa and Matt Looney for jumping off for Bass Cat. Really enjoyed this week uh, as we get ready for the Bassmaster Classic on a lake that is near and dear to my heart, uh, Grand Lake, and a lake that all of us uh, in Oklahoma are very proud of uh, with a rich history on it. A lot of team tournaments, a lot of money won, a lot of memories uh, on that fishery. And more will be added this week as we crown a Bassmaster Classic champ. So that's all we got for today. Recorded show with Frank Scalish tomorrow. He dives into some of his classic memories, some of the decisions that he made during his two classics in 2002 and 2010 on Lay Lake that he still uh, either thinks was a good decision or that he still thinks about on a daily basis how he wishes he could have done it differently. It's a really good episode with Frank. 
Uh, and then you can come talk to me and Frank about it on Saturday, 1230 at the Pradco booth and Sunday at noon at the Pradco booth. A limited number of the color number sevens will be available for Frank to sign. Until then, we'll see you in Tulsa this week. Later.